If I could have your attention just for a second, please. All right. It would be a miracle if this works, right? We have an extraordinary uh, keynote today in uh, Gerbir Grewal, and it's only fitting that we have an extraordinary person to introduce Gerbir. We have Professor Joe Grunfest. Joe, can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Awesome. Okay. I can't believe it. Uh, so Joe is a professor of law and business at Stanford Law School. He's a brilliant attorney. He's one of the most influential attorneys in the United States. Among the many things you can thank Joe for is, uh, as we heard about earlier, founding the Stanford Securities Class Action Clearinghouse, which has been an invaluable tool for decades now. And of course, Joe was previously a commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Joe, uh, you're the perfect person for this introduction. We're thrilled to have you join us today. Let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here, Gerbier. Welcome to Silicon Valley. Uh, and let me just warn you right at the outset, the topic that you're going to be talking about today touches on the question of zealous representation by attorneys. And as I've explained to you, Gerbier, I take this very personally because it's a threat to my marriage. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I hear the chuckling. How is it, you might ask, that a speech by the head of the enforcement division touching on the topic of zealous representation can threaten my matrimonial bliss? Let me explain. Let's go back approximately 44 years to that fateful evening in 1978 when I proposed to the long-suffering Carol. And I do mean long-suffering, right? If there's a woman that's known pain and torment for 44 years, this is the one. So this is what was happening. Prior to that evening, I'd been studying for the ethics portion of the bar, and Carol, who is much, much smarter than I, is just looking over my shoulder, and she's absorbing all of the ethics rules infinitely more quickly and with much more subtlety and sophistication than I. So the great night comes, and I wind up proposing marriage to Carol. We're sitting on the sofa. She looks at me, and she says, wait a minute. She gets up, and she walks out of the room. I got to tell you, when a guy's proposing marriage, the last thing in the world he wants is for the victim to stand up, walk out of the room. It's not what you're thinking. Fortunately, 30 seconds later, she comes back and she's carrying with her a penny. And she looks at me and she says, okay, if I understand the ethics rules properly, if I become your client, your obligation will be zealously to defend my interests. I said, yes. And you would never be able to do anything contrary to my best interests. Absolutely. And you would always have to respect my confidences and you'd have to put my interests ahead of yours. I go, yes. So she says, before I respond to your marriage proposal, I'd like to retain you as my counsel. <laughs> so at this point, I'm kind of going, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> right? She's... She's got me over a barrel many, many times. I say, well, okay, I have my first client. And then she goes, okay, you also have your first wife. So, so it was only because of my ability accurately to represent with absolutely no qualification that I was going to put her interests ahead of mine and zealously defend her interests that I am a happily married man today. Now, Imagine if I would have had to respond, look, I will zealously represent your interests unless it hacks off Gerbier and the SEC. That would not be an equally romantic occasion, not by a long shot. So Gerbier, I just want you to understand that there's a certain perspective from which I take portions of what you might say with a personal interest, all right? And we'll be listening very, very carefully and with that, by way of an introduction, good luck with the speech, Gerbier. I think that's my cue. <laughs> uh, good yes, afternoon. it is. It's my cue? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, Joe, uh, thank you, I think, uh, for that very unique introduction. Uh, and, and thank you to, to Bruce Carton for the uh, invitation to speak. After sitting through some of the prior panels, I don't know whether I should give a speech or a rebuttal, um, but I, I'll stick to my, my prepared remarks. And uh, as is customary, 
Uh, I'll start with the disclaimer that my remarks today express my own views and don't reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, uh, or other members uh, of the staff. Um, listen, ordinarily at an event like this one, with so many members of the defense bar present, uh, with so many enforcement colleagues present, I would spend my time highlighting all the ways in which we at enforcement are working tirelessly to protect investors. I would talk about our increased focus uh, in, and dedication of resources to our new crypto assets and cyber unit. Uh, I talk about our focus on private funds, and I would talk about other enforcement priorities. And based on earlier conversations, I'd likely close by reassuring each of you in the defense bar that we're not doing away with the Wells process or the white paper process. We're just streamlining it and making it slightly more efficient. Uh, and I do this at my own peril because I didn't realize I was driving into the valley of the law firms because we're surrounded by big firms uh, at this hotel. Uh, but I'd like to take a, a slightly different approach this afternoon in my remarks uh, based on some recent experiences and observations over the last number of months in this role. And this has been referred to earlier uh, on the panel before me by Randall and others. Uh, an animating principle for me has been to increase public confidence in our markets and in government. An animating principle for me is to counter the declining trust in our institutions that we're experiencing right now in this moment. You see, there's a perception among too many, among large segments of the population really, that corporate wrongdoers are not being held accountable and that there are in fact two sets of rules, one for the big and powerful and another for everyone else. And while there are many reasons for these beliefs and for these trends, delayed accountability doesn't help. And that's why since day one, I've been asking staff to look for ways in which to push the pace of our investigations. The public must have confidence that when they read a news story today about corporate malfeasance, that we will move quickly to investigate what happened and to hold wrongdoers accountable even in the most complex of cases. You saw an example of that recently in our actions against Archegos Capital Management, its founder, Bill Wong, and others. But one thing I hear frequently from staff is how the conduct of defense counsel in some of our cases frustrates and delays our truth-seeking mission. For example, I just recently learned about a document production in an investigation concerning an entity with billions in assets. It would be overly generous to call this particular document production a rolling production. Despite our best efforts, over the course of the past six months, we've received about 200 documents. And just recently, we got one page, one page, when we asked for information about U.S. customer account and trading data. Needless to say, that type of production makes it very difficult for us to assess whether there's been a violation of the U.S. securities laws. None of what I'm describing is new. One of my predecessors, Rob Kuzami, gave a speech about questionable behavior by defense counsel and SEC investigations. From slow, from slow rolling document productions, as I just described, to representing multiple witnesses with adverse interests in the same matter, and get this, to kicking witnesses during testimony to get them to answer questions in a certain way, Director Kazami cataloged many ways in which defense counsel undermined the SEC's investigative process. Unfortunately, a decade on from that speech, we continue to see some of these same behaviors, as well as newer forms of the same tactics. In other words, while folks have stopped kicking witnesses under the table, they've moved to more subtle behaviors. And to be clear, like Joe's wife, I fully appreciate and welcome zealous advocacy. I, you know, after all, and Joe, Joe made this point clear, good defense lawyers, and others have made this point clear earlier today, good defense lawyers in the Wells process and in other ways help us ensure that our enforcement decisions are fair and informed. But dilatory or obstructive conduct is not zealous advocacy. Far from it. I think it's behavior that frustrates our processes, it puts investors at risk, and it contributes to that declining trust I talked about a moment ago. 
Delay, for example, may enable a fraudster to dissipate assets or place them beyond our reach. A needlessly lengthy accounting fraud investigation could mean that markets lack accurate information about a public company for an extended period of time. And advisory clients, unaware of a potential conflict, may keep money invested with the firm when given full information, they would choose a different money manager. Protracted investigations also impose costs on the individuals and the firms involved. Most obviously, there are reputational costs that an issuer might incur after disclosing an investigation, but before its delayed resolution. Those reputational costs may in turn impose economic costs on shareholders. There are also, of course, the legal bills. Legal bills that result from unduly extended negotiations or needless disputes over routine investigatory issues. And finally, and, and importantly, there are the psychological and emotional costs for individuals, both subjects and witnesses who are involved in these investigations. So when counsel dis decide to dispute plainly reasonable requests, delay productions, prolong testimony, or otherwise frustrate our investigations, it can exacerbate all of the costs that I just described. And I think it's for those reasons and others that it's in our collective interest to ensure that our investigations move quickly and efficiently. So with that, what exactly are we seeing right now? Let me return to document productions for a second. We all know that documents are the lifeblood of many investigations. They can provide investigative leads. They can help refresh witness recollections of distant events. And they can supply powerful contemporaneous evidence of those same events. And compliance with document production obligations is one of Defense Council's most effective means of ensuring that we timely reach the underlying facts. We fully understand that these productions can be both costly and time intensive for counsel and their clients. That's why staff routinely negotiate with defense counsel on the scope of such requests and on production schedules, including by issuing more targeted requests, accepting rolling, rolling, not trickling productions, and by finding alternative ways to get at the same information. And we also, fully recognize that there are many potential causes for hitches in production, so we don't automatically assume that they're the result of gamesmanship. But now with that said, too often we see defense counsel, even enforcement alums, engage in conduct that seems to have little purpose other than to delay our investigations. At times, this comes in the form of a simple blown production deadline, even one that was carefully negotiated. And at other times, it comes in the form of a document dump of terabytes of irrelevant material, or again, trickling productions like the one I just described. So when we see counsel repeatedly encountering unexplained issues that delay productions across different cases, across different clients, it undermines not just our process, but also the trust that counsel has with staff. And while this is a different trust than the public trust I've spoken about so far, it's also critical to rebuilding that public trust. Listen, one of the most valuable qualities an effective defense lawyer can have is credibility with the staff. I think we've all experienced this firsthand in some way. That close call when it's counsel's credibility that carries the day. That close call that carries the day and drives a favorable and a fair and a timely resolution. That's why it's important to always maintain that credibility on both sides. Trust between staff and counsel, and staff and witnesses for that matter, is also important in the context of investigative testimony. As I'm sure all of the lawyers in this room instruct their clients, a witness's primary responsibility is to truthfully answer staff's questions. And the staff in turn are responsible for asking precise questions designed to elicit relevant information. When a witness misunderstands a question, the potential confusion that results can disserve all those involved. Now, counsel can, and sometimes do, alleviate these potential issues by, for example, preparing witnesses in advance, asking clarifying questions, or directing the witness to provide information that counsel believes will assist the staff's understanding. But unfortunately, sometimes counsel create or amplify misunderstandings or so distrust between the witness and the staff. 
when experienced counsel who are well aware that the federal rules of evidence do not apply in our investigative testimony repeatedly interrupt testimony to lodge hearsay or other inapplicable objections, trust can be eroded. When counsel repeatedly speak over the witness or attempt to answer questions, trust can be eroded. When counsel overtly coach the witness on how and whether to answer a question, trust can be eroded. And when such tactics needlessly prolong a testimony and prevent staff from addressing all of the factual items at issue, it serves neither the staff nor the witness who will simply be called to testify again. Now, just as trust on the macro level is foundational to the rule of law, on the micro level, the legal system is built on trust between lawyers and their clients. And that particular trust can also be compromised. For example, it can be compromised when attorneys who may be potential fact witnesses in our investigations appear as counsel. These representations typically end with lawyers conflicting themselves out of a matter at the 11th hour. It often happens in the Wells process, and it puts their clients in difficult situations. While certain firms always ask themselves at the outset of an engagement, can we represent the company in such circumstances? I believe that the more relevant question, and the one that we as lawyers always need to ask ourselves is, should we take on this representation? A lot of the problematic conduct we see from lawyers stems from a misguided emphasis on the can rather than on the should. Relatedly, it's also troubling when counsel assert the attorney-client privilege in situations where its application appears clearly unwarranted. In these cases, the assertion itself appears to be more a form of aggressive lawyering or gamesmanship than a good faith effort to protect the sanctity of that relationship. The privilege is the bedrock element of our legal system, one of them for sure. And we have a tremendous respect for it. And we have a tremendous respect for other analogous protections like the work product doctrine. It's in our collective interest, again, that clients seek counsel and make well-informed business decisions. And that those conversations leading to those decisions, that those deliberations are candid and that they're protected. But when we see questionable privilege claims, we'll probe them. And if after discussions with counsel, we still believe that a claim of privilege is not supported, we may file a subpoena enforcement action and let a judge review the materials to determine whether emails with the lawyer randomly copied on them without more or notes of meetings where a lawyer just happened to be present and no advice was requested or provided are truly privileged. Now, while clients and their counsel will make their own decisions about subpoena compliance, they should all appreciate the potential monetary and reputational costs that they can incur as a result of subpoena enforcement litigation. The behaviors that I'm describing, these aren't inherently part of effective advocacy, and they don't necessarily serve clients' interests. In some cases, by engaging in these tactics, defense counsel may even forfeit their client's opportunity to obtain cooperation credit. This brings me to the way forward. Beyond the benefits I've discussed to the markets and investors as a whole, when defense counsel and their clients proactively cooperate with our matters in ways that save staff resources and streamline investigations, it can yield tangible benefits for all clients. As we've seen in a number of recent cases, and we've heard you because we've tried to make this clear in our OIPs, when clients take steps to self-report potential violations or to proactively cooperate with our investigations and remediate violations, the Commission is often willing to credit that cooperation, including through reduced penalties or no penalties at all. I'm often asked at events like this one to explain what I mean by cooperation. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. To me, cooperation is much more than the absence of obstruction. Cooperation to me is an affirmative behavior. If you're delaying our investigation by slow walking document productions, by trying to put off witness testimony for an excessive period of time, or by being obstructive during testimony, you're not cooperating, no matter what you say or your client's AK may say. There's no exhaustive checklist of what constitutes cooperation either. Though as described in Seaboard, behaviors such as self-reporting and remediation fall well within the rubric of cooperation. But here are some more examples of the types of cooperation that could earn credit. 
When your clients are involved in an investigation, you can make documents or witnesses available to us on an expedited basis. You can highlight hot documents or provide translations of key documents where applicable. You can flag documents that you know we'd be interested in, but might arguably be beyond the reach or request contained in our subpoenas. You can also make presentations to the staff during the course of an investigation that are more than simply advocacy pieces, but that meaningfully illuminate events. And where your client may have violated the law, you can counsel them to own that violation and work in good faith to remedy it. In short, you can take steps that enable us to efficiently conduct our investigation, that enable us to protect investors, and that enable all of us to rebuild trust in our markets and in the law. I've talked now at length about defense counsel behavior. So let me take a moment to talk a bit about how we enforcement, we in an we in enforcement conduct ourselves. As long as I'm director, I expect enforcement staff to continue to practice, as it historically has, what I've preached today. In short, we will work with a sense of urgency. We will not play games during our investigations, our negotiations, or in our litigations. We don't play games with Wells notices. If we tell you we plan to recommend charges, it means that we're prepared to litigate any resulting action pending consideration of your well submissions. We don't play games like threatening potential charges to gain leverage in negotiations at, or at trial if we don't in good faith believe that the evidence supports recommending those charges. Enforcement actions are far too serious to be used in this way. We don't play games with admissions. If we say during settlement negotiations that we demand admissions, we mean it, and we're prepared to litigate the case if the commission authorizes the action. Admissions are not a bargaining chip. And this is true more broadly. We don't play games with our settlement demands. This doesn't mean that our opening offer is always our final offer, but it does mean that our offer is a product of rigorous thought about the appropriate outcome, that it's calibrated to the case and to the conduct. And while there may be flexibility in certain aspects of it, and yes, on occasion, we may get it wrong, you should not assume that everything is subject to negotiation. The enforcement process is not a bazaar. It's a serious undertaking. And I think we all need to treat it with the respect that it deserves. In recent remarks, Commissioner Lee spoke about how the legal profession stands apart from other businesses principally because advocating for fidelity to the law is, at its core, a form of public service. I couldn't agree more. And because the practice of law is fundamentally an expression of the importance of the rule of law, trust in the legal profession is an essential element of civil society. If the public doesn't believe that officers of the court take seriously our obligation to uphold not just the letter of the law, but also its spirit, then I think our society is weaker for it. All of that also informs why I wanted to talk to you about how we can work together to rebuild public trust, not just in our markets, but also in the process in our profession. And for those who want to work with us more closely in this shared endeavor, I'm happy to share that we are hiring. We are rebuilding our ranks after you've taken away a lot of our good folks <laughs> as I look across this room. Uh, but we're hiring across the board, and we're hiring right here in the Bay Area. So I encourage you to consider joining what I've come to learn in my short tenure is among the finest group of public servants that I've ever had the privilege of serving with. I want to thank you, uh, Bruce Carton. Uh, I want to thank our, our hosts at the Securities uh, Enforcement Forum for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I know it's a heavier topic than you're probably used to, but I think it's an important topic because this is truly a shared endeavor if we hope to get this right. So thank you for your time this afternoon. It's been great to be with you in person. Thank you, Grabeer. Uh, really thoughtful and important points, and we, we really appreciate it. And we really appreciate you making the trip here to join us on the West Coast. So thank you so much. Uh, our next panel will begin at uh, roughly 1.40. Um, and we'll get started. We'll get, we'll get going on the afternoon. Thank you.